Good morning, everyone. Oh, come on. We get the next hour and a half together. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I had to like check, is it still morning? Yes, it is. Can you join me in thanking the organizers, the wonderful team at Girls 20 for putting together this fantastic leadership forum? Thank you so much. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to be with all of you this morning on a topic that is incredibly important and something that we can apply into our day-to-day -day lives. Yes, we're going to be talking about GBA+, plus, so Gender-Based Analysis+, plus, and we're going to be talking about it as it relates to policies and programs, but what we learned today, we can actually apply to things like the emails we send, the text messages we send. We're going to look at things like unconscious bias. Right? So we're going to explore many different areas as it relates to GBA+. But my goal here is to show you the process, the model that actually the government uses when they're doing budgets, but also how you can apply it into your day-to-day. -day. Now this is a workshop, so you're going to be getting to know the people at your tables. You're going to be doing some activities as well, and we do have an hour and a half together. Are you excited? I'm so excited, so this is great. Okay, so um, in terms of today's conversation, a welcome, we'll do an intro to GBA+, what it is, why it's important, and why is it that we include it. We're actually gonna go through each of the stages of GBA+, so that you have an understanding of what each stage entails. We'll talk about the benefits, some conclusions, and then I will open it up to Q&A. Okay, so that's our agenda for today. What our main learning objective, what I want and hope that you get out of today's workshop, integrate GBA+, whether that's in your academic studies, whether that's in the communication, let's say you're hosting an event, right, to be able to integrate GBA+, even if it's parts of the process. To think about how is it that we communicate, how is it that we develop and design programs, right? All of these things are very, very important. So gender-based analysis focuses on gender. The plus aspect of it focuses on different intersecting factors, right? So that's where GBA plus comes from. So thank you, Miriam, for the wonderful introduction. I'm not going to spend much time on my introduction, but I wanted to point out a few things. So um, I am an entrepreneur, I've been an entrepreneur for almost 16 years now, and I often get the question, what do you do? And when I try to explain, no, no one really understands. But here's the thing, um, being a visible minority culturally, and also being female or identifying as female, being an entrepreneur isn't very accepted, right? You don't fit into this box. And when I had gotten married, I was told by a few family members, okay, now you can stop working. And I was also told, stop traveling so much. I ended up traveling more that year just to, you know, show that I can travel more. But it was this idea of you don't fit into a box. What do you mean you're an entrepreneur? What do you mean you're a boss? Right? And so I, for 16 years, have been fighting those cultural norms. For a number of years, we actually didn't share with extended family that I was running my own business. Right? So when we think about GBA+, plus, there's all these different factors that come into play. Um, I did do my PhD. I was the first in my family to get a graduate degree, and that came with some interesting comments as well. Right? Again, once, once you finish, okay, now focus on your family. Well, I've been focusing on my family this entire time. Right? So when we think about this, there are challenges that we face. There are systemic challenges, which we're going to talk about. There's also personal challenges. And oftentimes, these personal challenges come from comments from other people or their values, which right or wrong, that no judgment there, none of it is right, wrong, good, bad, positive, negative, it just is, but it can have an impact on how we feel. Now, Mary mentioned that, mentioned that I led a study called Tall Poppy Syndrome. What this means is this, and very important, especially for you young leaders in the room. What Tall Poppy Syndrome is this, the term was coined in Australia. It takes the metaphor of poppies, the flower. So poppies, the flower, are supposed to grow together. When one flower grows too tall, it gets cut down. So it's the exact same size as the other poppies in the field. So we translate this into the workplace. And so what we wanted to look at was the experience that women had in the workplace in Canada. And when they achieved something, when they had a success, were they cut down by others? Were they attacked? Were they ostracized? Were they resented by others? So I led this study in partnership with Thompson Routers and Women of Influence. We had over 1,500 respondents. 87.3% of women said that they were attacked, resented, or ostracized because of their success. 
87.3%. I had 268 pages of data, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories, of stories of how, what women experienced in the workplace because they achieved something. The comments, the actions, and it impacted things like their self-confidence. 70% of women said it impacted their self-confidence. They engaged in negative self-talk. 50% said they left their organization, right? So top talent leaving, harder to replace, more expensive to replace, but guess who's staying in these organizations? The cutters, right? So when we think about things like tall poppy syndrome, when we think about ambition and our goals, when we look at gender-based analysis, yes, we're gonna talk about a process, we're gonna talk about a structure and how we can apply it, but it would be very, I, I would be, incorrect to not talk about other nuances that also exist and how those nuances impact us as young leaders. I'm still calling myself young, so just putting that out there too. Um, I am a professor, so I do teach. I taught at Humber for six years. I teach at McMaster. I also teach at Sheridan. Um, I write, I speak. I love what I do. Most importantly, I'm Kish and Jay's mom. And so he is my three and a half year old son, and I had him later in life. Right? And that came with questions as well. Other questions of when's your next one, so on and so forth, staring at my stomach. Like, like we can stop there, but again, nuances, right? Expectations. And how does that connect to our unconscious biases? So, although I love what I do, it has come with its challenges. Challenges that we have to navigate and build through our self confidence and our self worth. Okay? Sounds good? Awesome. All right, so let's do an intro to what GBA plus is and what, uh, what the analysis part is. It is analytical, it is systematic, it is consistent, and most importantly, this process is evidence-based. The federal government uses this process all the time with programs, policies, the budget that they create. They used GBA+. It's a process by which a policy, program, or an initiative or service can be examined for its impact on groups of men, of women, and gender diverse people. Okay? So however someone chooses to identify. There's multiple intersecting factors. That's the plus piece. Right? Because we can't just look at things like gender and how we identify. And I often have time, uh, well, I often have an issue with this idea, follow me for a second, of equality. Let me tell you I have an issue with equality. Because equality does not mean equity. And this is why. So let's say I have a chocolate bar. My professor shared this with me and I'll never forget it. So let's say I have a chocolate bar and I say, okay, someone who identifies as a woman, you come to the table. Someone who identifies as male, come to the table. Equal opportunity, right? Equal opportunity. Now, let's say I took a chair, put it here, and I stood up on the chair and went like this. I can still claim equal opportunity, but who's gonna get the chocolate bar? The one who's taller. It may be equal opportunity, but it is not equitable opportunity. There's an organization my colleague works for. She has to leave an hour earlier than all the other uh, facilitators because she has to pick up her son. She is docked $200 because of that. And the organization stands behind while well, we pay all of our facilitators equally. Well, that's not the problem. Is it equitable? Right? So when we think about how we design things like programs, things like events, right? There's a difference between equal and equitable opportunity. We also want to take in the plus into consideration. So this can include things like race, ethnicity, religion, age, mental, physical abilities, right? All of these things are incorporated. And these things with the GBA plus process are considered when we do our analysis. What it does do, it provides a snapshot of the realities of individuals affected by a particular issue in time. But here's the thing, sometimes what we think the issue is actually isn't the issue at all, right? So we're going to get into that, we're defining what the actual issue, what problem is it that we're trying to solve, right? It's only when we go through the process that we can really understand, okay, is this the problem, is this the issue, right? Because sometimes what we think it is, it absolutely is not at all. 
So this is the GBA Plus process. I do want to mention there is an online course um, that is available that is free. It takes about three or four hours to complete. Um, they used to be called Status of Women Canada. It's now called Wage. You could take it. There is a beautiful certificate at the end and it goes deeper into this process. But this is what the process is based on developed by wage. And so you'll notice communicate and document is on the sides of the process because that's something that we continue to do throughout the process. The first thing in the process is we want to identify what we think the issue is and I'm going to go into detail about each of these. We then want to challenge our assumptions because again what we think it might be it might not be. So we have to challenge our own assumptions. What biases are we coming in with? We then gather the facts, research and consult. We develop options and make re uh, recommendations and we monitor and evaluate, right? That's the process. And it doesn't end there. When we monitor, evaluate, we see, okay, where can we improve? But what's happening with programs, policies, initiatives, events, anything that we do, we always have this idea, well, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, the other way of looking at that is if it ain't broke, break it, build it again, and see where your gaps are, right? So we can take this process and apply it to anything that we're doing. Even if something is working, we may not have taken into consideration other variables. So I, I absolutely love this process. So why? Why is it that we're going to talk about it today? Why was it that it's mandatory for our program? Because we actually might be unconsciously designing different policies or programs that have unintended consequences for specific groups. And here's the thing, our intentions might be great, right? But we might not be thinking through who is it that we might be leaving out. So we might be creating unintended consequences. We might have some incorrect assumptions, right? Uh, and this could lead to unintended impacts on particular groups of people that we're not even aware of. And the process contributes to the advancement of gender equality in Canada, okay? So this is what it is that, or why it is that we focus on GBA+. So why is it needed? Because women in Canada who work full time earn an average of only 87 cents to every dollar earned by men. We know this from Statistics Canada three years ago. Women are more often the victims of domestic and sexual violence. So I teach this course at McMaster University. In my class, I had an individual who was a detective with Hamilton Police Services. And when he did his assignment, he told me, so he worked on domestic abuse cases. He has now taken this process and applies it to every domestic abuse case, right? Because he's like, yeah, I went in and I thought, and in his assignment, and I sh we've actually shared the assignment with um, Wage because it was so powerful, right? He didn't know the assumptions he was coming in with. He would categorize. And then now he takes this process and applies it to those domestic abuse cases. Women are underrepresented in leadership and executive positions. We know this. They occupy only 23% of board positions in Canada's top 500 corporations. Here's my other issue. We say we need more representation at the table. 100% I agree with that. The wholeheartedly, no question. But here's my issue. We can have representation at the table. But when they come to the table, do we silence them, right? Do we ignore them? My data suggests that we do, right? So it's not just about representation at the table. It's do we give, and it's not even our position to, be, to give. Do we allow, do we facilitate an environment where people have a voice, everyone? and there's psychological safety. So this year I ran a study with Canadian Mental Health Association. It comes out on the International Day of Happiness, which is March 20th, and we looked at Canadian happiness at work. What we found was we had over 1,150 respondents. What we found was that, and this is important for all of us here, 50% of respondents, and all the ones that sit on boards, 50% of respondents did not have psychological safety with their board of directors. That number exceeded the number of people that identified not having psychological safety with their supervisor or manager. So what does psychological safety mean? What it means, what it means is I feel safe 
I am, I'm able to express what I think, what I feel, my ideas, without fear of negative consequence. 50% of respondents believe there'll be negative consequence if they express what they thought from their board of directors. That's huge, right? We don't feel safe to share what it is that we're thinking and feeling, right? And sometimes there's fear of bullying on boards. Right? It happens. It abs I sit on three boards. It happens. So um, there is a gap. Uh, the gap is larger for women with particular intersecting identity factors. We know this. We know this. And this is why GBA Plus matters. All right. So let's get into the workshop element. Please tell me, what is the difference between sex and gender? Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that? Yes. Gender is more like socially constructed and mm -hmm. like culture and honor. Excellent. Perfect. Excellent. Wonderful. So when we think about sex versus gender, and I'll tell you why it's important in a moment, this is the biological differences that we have. It's biological. Whereas when we talk about gender, that's that social context, the social norms, how we identify. And it really um, impacts like the society and the cultural categories as what we identify as ma uh, masculine as well as feminine. Right? Big boys don't cry. So I was flying with my son, he was about 18 months at that time, and he was crying as we're waiting for customs, and the gentleman behind me was trying to be lovely and say to him, you know, big boys don't cry, and I'm like, do I engage or do I not? Do I really? I'm tired, he's crying, I, I didn't. I understood what he was trying to do, but it wasn't right. Of course big boys can cry, right? Of course big boys can cry. Um, when my son was two and a half, he was in daycare, and the daycare teacher came up to me, and she said, I'm so sorry, I didn't know what to say. I was like, what happened? And she said, the, the kids were playing with my bracelets, and I, I made a comment that only ladies wear ba bracelets. Well, no, but, and then all the kids said, no, Kishin wears a bracelet. That was interesting, right? It was interesting. First of all, not only ladies wear bracelets, but secondly, all the kids that are all under four years old had noticed that my son wears a bracelet. They had noticed that. I'm sure he loved the attention because he's two and a half, but what if he was eight or 13, right? And so comments that we make like mailman, salesman, cleaning lady, right? And also when we think about these norms and this, the difference between sex and gender, it starts at a very early age. I'm going to show you a video about that. We talk about gender reveal parties. You're not revealing the gender of the child. You're revealing its sex. But we call them gender reveal parties. There's often colors that are associated with that, specific toys that are associated with that, right? And norms. So we want to make sure we differentiate between sex and gender. We want to talk about non-binary, and we can address it as agender, bigender, genderqueer, identifies that are not exclusively masculine or feminine. Right? When we did our first survey in 20, what year are we in? 2018, we asked people to identify as a demographic, we get demographic information, and we picked male, female, and prefer to self-describe. This year, completely different. We had so many different options because that wasn't inclusive enough, right? That wasn't inclusive enough. And so when we, wa when we think about non-binary, we want to make sure that we are being inclusive. So the PLUS in GBA recognizes that analysis goes beyond the biological sex, right? That's the PLUS. That's the importance of it. And also the gender, which is socially constructed um, differences. All right, now what I'm going to get you to do, I'm going to give you about four minutes. In your groups, you're going to do this. You're going to pick any one of these variables. You can choose as a group whichever one you want to do. You're going to pick one variable. You're going to discuss how does this variable impact and influence gender roles. Okay, so you're going to get four, four and a half, maybe five minutes.
to discuss. Pick any variable. You can pick age, class, race, ethnicity, religion, geographic, political environments, or you can pick a variable on your own. Any variable that you want. And for four-ish minutes, talk about how does that variable impact and influence gender roles. Go. All right, I'm going to collect you back up here. I'm hearing some amazing things. I'm so excited to hear from you. Um, which group would like to start us off? What variable did you choose, and how does it influence gender roles? Who wants to start us off? Yes. We were having actually a really interesting discussion about a different table, but we we're actually questioning like how GPA is constructed, like an area of improvement. Because like one thing that I was saying, like my experiences with the federal government, I find that uh, GPA plus leads to marginal benefits for other people. Yes. And like um, so, when we're talking about gender equality, quite often in spaces and in teams and in offices, there will be like gender proportionality. There will be white women. Mm -hmm. So, how do you ensure that, that gender proportionality is equitable? Yes. And that's the question. Love. And again, the equality piece, but is it equitable? That's the question. Someone asked me, what is my hope for International Women's Day this year? Is that we go beyond the conversation of equality and we begin to speak about equity. Excellent. Who'd like to go next? Not all at once. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, we uh, talked about the ethnicity piece yes. um, and kind of gender roles that um, apply to that, also like many other categories. But um, yeah, we just uh, talked about different cultural norms and uh, expectations and pressures that come um, with that piece. You mentioned many of them. Um, if you are not pregnant at a what is seen as an appropriate time or what is wrong with you if you're not married by a certain mm -hmm. age. Um, sexuality can come into question if that's the case too. Um, we also had uh, like career goals and choices um, that are seen as uh, more or less appropriate based mm -hmm. on um, your uh, sex or gender. Um, yeah, we also had um, living and traveling alone uh, can be seen as uh, more into question quite a bit for um, for women. Um, in general, especially when ethnicity is applied. Um. Amazing. And we're going to build on a lot of what it is that you're saying. Thank you. I wish I had more time with them. Can I like stay? Like I just want you all day. This, oh, okay. Who's next? Yes. Uh, our table, we talked a little bit of class and specifically in regards to motherhood. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like for women, there's a very broad, if you choose motherhood, and yes. you go down that route, there's a very broad, Expectation of what it, in a high expectation of what it is to be a good mother, but mm. if you are um, if you are a lower class if you are in a lower class economic bracket, you might have that pressure to still be in a great mother who makes all these at home meals and like what is called working the second shift. Mm -hmm. But then you also have another job because you have to provide an income. Yeah. And so there's all this pressure to be perfect, and be a great mom, and to be completely involved and dive into your kid's life while also having to maintain other things. And that's different, very different for a woman. Exactly. Um, in a higher income bracket. And how we define what a good mom is. Yeah. Who are we to define what a good mom is, right? Yes, exactly. And I, I remember one day I was very upset and I woke up and I, and I said, I'm like, the, our system is not built for single moms. And I was thinking about this idea of if a single mom's child gets sick, and she can't take time off work because she has to go pay the bill. What does she do? And, and so I was really upset about this. And I said to my colleague, I'm like, I'm like, the system's broken. It's not meant for these single moms. And this is what he said to me. He said, the system works perfectly. It works exactly how it was meant to work. And that opened my eyes. It, was, it works exactly how it was designed to work, right? So it's not that the system is broken how it was designed, whatever it is. That was powerful. Thank you. Yes, you want to add? Yeah, I should add, because we, we touched on like quite a few things, but when it came to age, like I see it especially as like someone who's like very young, like I noticed that people have very different expectations for women and men based on their age. Mm -hmm. And I see it in real life. I see, I have two cousins who are both 27 years old. And a male and a female, and at 27, like, I feel like that's a very critical age. Mm -hmm. So for women, like, my female cousin had so many more expectations. What are you doing with your job? Like, when are you getting married? Like, are you planning on having kids? Like, this is when it's your time to figure it out. And with my 27-year-old male cousin, like, really not the same question. 
mm -hmm. why. Yeah. And so, like, I think that, like, based on age, like, especially around that time, like, motherhood, it's a huge difference. Absolutely. And I heard your group, because I was eavesdropping, talking also about microaggressions. Right? So powerful. So in my study, the tall poppy one, here's an example of micro, uh, a microaggression. And again, microaggressions, you're well-intentioned, but what you might say might come across as offensive. So here's an example. Congratulations, you got the job. I know they were looking for a woman to fill the role. Right? So I'm saying congratulations, because I actually like uh, congratulations, but then I'm discounting your qualifications and saying, yes, you only got it because you identify as a woman, right? So microaggressions come up as well, especially age. We can, we can talk about age and microaggressions. Excellent. Anyone want to add? Last call, yes? Um, so our group talked about like, the variable of age, and just to add on to that too, we also talked about how it really starts from a young age, mm -hmm. so like, when you go to the stores, like, you see even like, clothing is going to be examples of that. Mm -hmm. like, young boys' clothing is like, um, like branded with lots of things like, Mm -hmm. Exactly, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add to that. We also have biases against young boys playing with kitchen stuff and dolls and putting on their mom's heels, right? And so when I talk about gender-based analysis plus, it's never, ever, or even unconscious bias about men versus women or however you identify. It's never a versus thing, right? But beautiful point. Right? Sometimes for young boys, we let them adventure. For young girls, not so much. But even for young boys, we don't really let them wear bracelets. Or we tell them that they shouldn't wear bracelets. So it's fascinating to see how this all plays out. Brill I wish we could continue on and talk about this because there's so much here. Right? But that's the thing when it comes to GBA+, plus, plus are those intersecting factors. And you can add age, class, race, ethnicity. You can put it all together. Right? You can put it all together. And we, can, we could talk about that. The importance of communication. So gender is used in a way to construct reality. It's how we try to make sense of things. It's how we try to make sense of the world, right? And how we communicate begins very early on. Remember, gender reveal parties. It begins before a child is even born. It continues in the classroom. And then it continues beyond. It goes into the workplace. So let me give you some examples. Recruitment process, resumes, although the study was from 2003, it's still prevalent today. Tell me, are Emily and Greg more employable than Lakeisha and Jamal? They received exact same resumes, different names, exact same resumes, they received 50% more callbacks for an interview. Right? The recruitment process is a hotbed for unconscious bias. And it's not just about the resumes. What happens when we bring them to be interviewed? So years ago, uh, 1970, in the 70s, only 10% of the US top five orchestras were made up of women. They introduced blind recruitment. So what they ended up doing was they put a panel in front of the person who was auditioning. And you actually even had to remove your shoes because if you were wearing heels, you might be identified in a certain way. So they did that, panels. This is what they found. Those who made it to the final round, 50% were women. 50% of women made it to the final round. Now fast forward, almost 50 years, well, 50 years later, only 30% of women are in the top five orchestras in the United States. Progress, so I won't discount that, but how can you tell me that 50% are making it to the final and we still only have 30% representation? So when we think about recruitment, it's not just about the resume, right? Not just about removing identifying factors. What happens when people get in the room? What happens during the interview process? And guess what? We all have biases. We all do. We all have them. It's not about right, wrong, good, bad, positive, negative. We need biases to survive. But what we're looking at is what happens when it's creating negative consequences for specific groups, okay? 
So we know, we know there's a pay gap. And again, yes, equal pay. Let's start there. And let's also add to that conversation equitable pay. Let's add equitable pay. And imposter syndrome. We know um, that those who identify as male, they, are, they tend to self-promote. They also will fight for a larger salary. So a study was done across Canada, coast to coast. This is what they did. They offered men and women the job, and they offered the same salary at a very low rate. What they were trying to see is how much would people negotiate up. Women negotiated up $5,000. Men, $20,000. Twenty thousand, right? Huge, absolutely huge. So let's do a deeper dive into the model. The first piece that we're going to start at the top, and remember, communicate, document. This is something we do throughout. The first piece is identifying the issue. Some key questions. Let's say we are designing a program. Some key questions we want to ask in that design phase. Do I have information on my clients or target groups? Have I consulted diverse sources? Right? So I want to define the issue, but do I have the information to understand what the actual issue is? Does the information suggest that the issue, uh, that the issue or initiative affects di diverse groups of people in different ways? If so, how? Does the initiative improve the situation for all, or does it have unintended differential impacts or create barriers for certain groups of people? Let me give you an example. I don't know if you remember this, but last year during International Women's Day, there was a huge debate on social media. And the question was, why do all International Women's uh, Day events include wine? Right? Why is it always a cocktail reception? And the argument was, there are many women that don't drink alcohol, don't feel comfortable being around alcohol for whatever reason it might be. Right? So hey, organizations, you're hosting International Women's Day events, why is it always a cocktail reception that includes alcohol? But here's the thing, great intention. Right? Let's celebrate International Women's Day. The question becomes, how are we celebrating it? That's why I love Girls 20 so much. Look at how we're celebrating. Right? So when we think about this, yeah, I'm going to design an event, I'm going to design an initiative, but is it creating unintended differential impacts on specific groups? Those who don't feel comfortable around alcohol, will they not attend? Then we want to challenge our assumptions, and I promise I'm going to tie this all in together. We've identified, let's say we identify the issue, we then want to challenge our own assumptions. Because again, as I said, we all have biases. Every single one of us in this room, we all have biases. So what we think the issue might be actually might not be the issue. Um, let me, let's take 10 seconds to look at this question. So, while driving on a highway, a father and son are involved in a terrible accident. The fire department is the first respondent at the scene. As the boy is carefully removed from the wreckage, one of the firefighters exclaims, that's my son. Who's the firefighter? The mom? The mom? Okay. Interesting. The mom was the traditional answer that this question looked for. The plus is that it could have been the partner the second father, right? Now here's the thing, so this, uh, this question, uh, there was a study done at, um, in Boston with the, the psychology students at the University of Boston. And this is what it did, it took 103 psychology students and 97 children between the ages of seven and 17 that were in camps around Boston, asked this exact same question, replaced firefighters with surgeon. 14% of psychology students had a said mother, 15% of the children identified mother, everyone else didn't know, right? So we have these biases. Sometimes we connect certain professions with specific gender roles, or sorry, with uh, specific sex. Let me show you a video as we continue to talk about um, unconscious bias. No, I would argue that this is a triumph of democracy. Scandals happen all the time. The question is, how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. Pardon me. 
My apologies. <laughs> What was this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months to a year because of North Korea's behavior. Uh, most recently, the use of VX gas in the airport in Malaysia that indicates that North Korea really doesn't follow global norms. How many of you remember watching this video? It's hilarious, right? So it went viral in March of 2017. So funny. I have double screens when I work. I watch a video, laugh, laugh, laugh. And then on my other screen, I have my social media. And there was a hashtag. I was like, what is this hashtag? So I clicked on the hashtag, and the hashtag was not the nanny. I'm like, I don't understand. So I clicked on it, and it was this huge debate online about that video. So half the people online were saying she's not the nanny, the woman in the video. And the other half are like, she's, or so they're saying not the nanny, she's his wife. The other ones are saying she's going to lose her job, right? Because she's the nanny. She wasn't the nanny. I'll admit to you in this group, I thought she was the nanny. And I study unconscious bias, right? I thought she was the nanny. It was a one minute clip, made me laugh, will never ever, I would have never ever watched it again for no other reason. I probably wouldn't have thought about it again. But in that one minute clip, my own bias, my own assumptions came to play. Right? So again, we all have them. It's understanding when do they create unintended consequences for specific people or specific groups. Now, um, there's also another debate about the father's response to the child, because the father went like this, and I went, what if that was a woman and she pushed her child away? How would society react? There was a third debate. The third debate was this. Everyone was arguing whether or not the man was wearing um, pajama pants, and if he, that's why he didn't stand up. And he actually addressed this and said, no, he wasn't. I do not believe him. But, <laughs> but he addressed that. He said, no, I was not wearing pajama pants, but again. So we all had an opinion. I was wrong. And that's the thing. When we think about whether, again, it could be a media clip, whatever it is, sometimes we can be wrong. Now, a week after that clip came out in New Zealand, um, they made a spoof to the video clip. Many of you may have seen it, you, some of you may have not. I'm going to play it and then we're going to have a conversation about this one too. The question now is how do people respond to their scandals? For the wider region, I think one of your children has just walked in, but I mean shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, it's un Clear at the moment what effect former President Gunhae's impeachment will have on the territories. Unfortunately, discontent in South Korea is not only related to President Gunhae's administration. <laughs> okay. This is a major embarrassment uh, for South Korea, who often criticizes the North of corruption, right. and who now find themselves in the middle of a massive corruption case themselves. Sorry, you do look rather busy there. We can reschedule this. President Gunhae is no. very likely to face jail time too. Okay. I would argue, in an attempt to make an example of her. Right, so what does this all mean for the future? of South Korea. So the future of South Korea really hangs in the balance. Oh my god, is that a bomb? <laughs> and it'll be Goodness interesting me. to see how the North reacts to this new shift in power. Indeed. Well, this certainly has been... Uh, sorry, your... your husband is... I anticipate there'll be more to come from this region in the next few months. Kate Wordsworth, you're obviously busy. Thank you so much for your time. All right, let's find this sock then. <laughs> and again, made as a spoof, it was making fun of the video that went viral. But tell me, what's happening in this video? Yes. As a mother, I can tell you uh, this is very real, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, basically women are expected to do everything. You're supposed to be the perfect wife, the perfect mother, the perfect employee. You bas basically have to be able to multitask. Women might see you as somebody who's failed women. Men will see you as, oh, they can't chalk up to men. But men are not expected to fulfill those same roles and do that. The expectations are so much lower for them. Mm -hmm. Because they're men. Obviously, they can do it all already, just mm -hmm. because of who they are. Mm -hmm. And the expectation can be that. Excellent. So, it, so again, the video was made strictly for comedy purposes. But what expectations, to your point, does it perpetuate? 
Right. What else? Anyone else want to add? Yes. What I found kind of interesting in the original clip is when his kids come in, he's like, he's not talking, like he's taken off guard. Mm -hmm. Whereas when her kids come in, she maintains like conversation and say, finishing her sentence while pulling her kid into her lap, yeah. playing with them. So I feel like maybe that's uh, kind of indicative of the fact that we're also expected to perform very mm. Those expectations. Absolutely. Excellent. I saw your hand up and I'll come here to, for the last comment. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's like you do have, like, there's the pressure to work two jobs. I feel like for women, and that could be working like a formal professional position or corporate position, whatever it may be, and then also working that role to another. Whereas the gender roles for men, it's like they come home. When they come home after their corporate job or whatever it may be, they're expected to just be able to get their feet up. Mm -hmm. That can be the case. That can be. Last comment, and I'm going to add a little bit. And, and there are men on social media that talk about, you know, when I go out and people are like, hey, are you babysitting your kid? And it's like, no, this is my kid, right? I'm not babysitting, it's my child, right? And I know male partners who have children together, right? So again, it's not men versus women or how we identify. It's understanding that there may be certain expectations put towards a specific role versus others. And is that right? Hi. Uh, talk about the first clip. Um, if that was the mother of the child, she came in and handled the kill children. Yeah. But how come there's no men or another partner coming in in this video clip? Mm -hmm. Like, are we supposed to, like, we're just expected to do all the tasks at home? And we're still not thankful. We're not thankful for that. Mm -hmm. That we can do so much stuff and we're not respected. They on the man clip, all he did was talk during the interview, but he was, a, he was respected for that. Why? Mm -hmm. Even though only he did one task. Yeah. Great questions. There's a lot of anger in this room. I can <laughs> feel it. Feel it. But not anger. It's passion. passion. That's exactly it. And it's asking the right questions. And guess what? We need to ask those questions to ourselves. Right? We need to, why did I think that was the nanny? Right? Why did I think that? We laugh at the second video, but guess what? When I go home, dinner is ready, I'm putting baby to sleep, I'm doing all of those things. It is a second shift. And I do it because I love it. But the expectation, right? Love the passion. Thank you. We have to move on. I know there's more comments, but we have to move on. So when we think about unconscious biases, right? We all have them. I just shared with you, I had one on a silly, funny video that was actually quite hilarious, right? We all have them. So when we think about challenging assumptions, it's understanding, okay, how much information do we process? So get this, there's a wonderful book by David Brooks called The Social Animal. He quotes Timothy D. Wilson, Stranger to Ourselves, and this is what Timothy D. Wilson says. Wilson says that at any given moment, each one of us can take in up to 11 million bits of information. Here's the deal. Conservatively, we each take in 40. 40 bits of 11 million bits. So your 40, very different than your 40, very different than your 40, very different than your 40. We rely on our past experiences. We rely on our mental models in order to fill in the blanks. Now, Cornell University says each one of us makes about 35,000 decisions every single day. 35,000. Roughly 225 have to do with food, so we can put that off the table. And if we take sleep into consideration, we're making roughly 2,000 decisions every single hour. So what does that mean? We rely heavily on our past experiences and our mental models in order to make sense of what's in front of us. Well, guess what? If we're designing a program, a policy, an initiative, an event, a communication, whatever it might be, and we're relying on those past reference points, how is that impacting what it is that we create? And more importantly, do we take a step back and ask ourselves, could I be wrong? Every time I taught leadership, on the first day of class, my students come in and I say to my class, I say, okay, those who don't know me, never took a class with me, how many of you thought that I'd be a man? And they laugh, they giggle, 90% of their hands go, yes, miss, sorry, miss, ha ha, miss, how'd you know, miss? And I ask them why, and oh, miss, because of your name. So when they get their schedules, they don't get Mr. or Miss, they get Professor Ramit Billen. 
and my name is gender neutral. But every class, without fail, yes, miss, I thought you were going to be a man. Right? And they were wrong. That's not how I identify. But I share this with you because you and I do this every single day. Right? We have limited information about a person, a group, a situation, a challenge. We have limited information. And we make judgments. Again, it's natural. Bias is necessary. But GBA Plus takes us, it, uh, encourages us to take that step back and say, OK, could I be wrong? Could I be wrong in what I'm assuming about this person, about this situation, about this challenge, about this program? Okay? And if we think about some key questions that we can ask when we are challenging assumptions are these. And by the way, you'll all get a copy of the PowerPoint, so not to worry about that. Right, Robin? OK. <laughs> how many individuals experience this issue? And how do they experience it differently? Are diverse groups of people interested in the same things in this message? And I'm going to share examples of that. What about the language that we're using? Right? What about the symbols that we're using, the examples in the communication? Let me give this example. Remember this? Right? Remember this? The symbols, the communication, what does this exemplify? This, OK, the next one I'm going to show you, I had to actually triple check. It was a real ad. OK? You'll see why I say that in a second. What the text says is this, spike your best friend's eggnog when they're not looking. Real ad, like I'm, this was not made up by Bloomingdale's. What are you trying to sell? Right? What are you trying to sell? So how we communicate. Remember during the Super Bowl one year, the, the lady Doritos? The ones that don't crunch as much and are silent and like, what are we selling? What are we communicating? And how are we, guess what? We are the ones consuming the media. How are we then interpreting that? And what is it perpetuating? So when I think about GBA+, yes, it applies to programs, policies. Yes, 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 yes. But it also applies to our everyday life. All right, next activity, I'm going to give you five minutes. This is a flyer for an upcoming event. I want you to discuss what are the challenges with this flyer. Okay, what do you see there? What assumptions is this flyer making? And how would you make changes to this? Okay, so you're planning an event. Five minutes, go ahead. All right, so tell me, tell me, what do you see in this flyer? What's coming up for you? I heard some passion. <laughs> yes. Hi. Right, so um, I am in business too. I run two businesses, and one of the biggest things in conferences and stuff with um, images like this is like you get so excited for the topic, you really want to go, and then you see pictures of three men, and you're like, "Well, I'm going to stand on like sore thumb." And people, and like it comes into like, "Oh, is there going to be harassment? Are men going to be Could like, be. you know, like you know, constantly staring?" And on top of that, Could one be. thing that they do at these conferences is that they use ladies as a derogatory term. And you're sitting there like, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm here, I'm not a lady, I guess. Yeah. You know? And they're like, don't sit on your asses and be like, you know, separate the strong men from like all the little like baby girls and like they say stuff like that. And it's oh, just, wow. Like, well, you know? Whoa. Uh, and then it, it, that's the environment that you take away from that fire immediately. And it's of like, course. Oh, of course. Oh, they're lucky I did not sit in that conference. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, kicking us off. I'm going to come here. Tessa, nice to see you. And I'm going to come to you, okay? Um, it looks like we have like three people, like three very, presumably very wealthy people, well off people, representing middle class entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. There's certain strategies that surround that. Like, I, I don't know if all of you can read it, maybe I'll talk to you guys. But <laughs> it all says like they all work in global, international, and world under each other little descriptions. Yeah. But it's like you're representing a small, Yeah. How is that representative of what's actually going on? Is the actual interact interaction within that? Yeah. Not and for and if we're talking about global too here, yeah. Tessa. What I first noticed was not even considering their race, but the first thing I noticed was that the man in the middle was at least who you perceived to be the oldest. Yeah. Um, so your eye directly goes to him. So he's kind of suggesting that that individual has the greatest amount of power. Absolutely. And when we're talking about men on the pa uh, panel, there's even no diversity, mm -hmm. right? Of men on the panel, yes. One phrase we hear like really often is like, you know, our generation is going to lead the society, and 
young people can control and they have the power. There's no young people mm -hmm. demonstrating this. If we have the power to lead the society, why aren't we being able to accept it in this meeting? Yeah. Absolutely. I'll add a few more other things. Accessibility. Look at how small the font is. Right? Accessibility. No, I can't even read that. Right? Like, like look at how small that is. Um, the fact that it's over three days. Is there a webcast for those that can't leave their families? I don't care if you identify as male or female. If you can't leave your family, is there a webcast available? Right? What are these options? Or if the young people we want you to attend, is there a discounted price? Right? For again, accessibility. Anyone else want to add anything before I go to the next one? Yes, we'll go here. Um, one of the things that I look at in my job is we do a lot of this stuff is um, also to make it clearly LGBT plus. Yes. And so, like, first of all, we a lot of the time we don't even put pictures of people on the invitation because that automatically makes people associate what type of people are supposed to be at these events. But then also, um, it's a very masculine color. Absolutely. Love that. Love that. And then we can take it a step further and say, okay, if we're not putting pictures, but we're putting just their names, are they still making assumptions about things like gender? Right? Fascinating. Love it. Thank you. I love that palette. I am going to, I'm, I'm going to do that. Thank you. I'll give you credit. I swear. <laughs> um, so, so why we do this activity. So as simple as communicating our event, Think about the language that we use, the pictures that we use, the font size that we use. Are we actually thinking about accessibility? Are we webcasting it? Or are we recording it so that it can be made available after? All of these things we want to think about when we talk about communicating our events. And then also hours. Like this one's okay from 11 to 3, fine. That allows for pickup and drop-offs and all of that sort of stuff. But usually conferences are 8.30 to like five, and then there's a cocktail thing that has networking, and you really want to attend that, but you can't because you got to get home, right? So we want to be mindful of what time that we're putting around certain events, and that sometimes evening events or very early morning events are not accessible by all. Yes? I noticed that it says free, which makes it a little more accessible, but yes. that speaks like chapter sourcing. Yes. A lot of times Exactly. Brilliant point. Um, so there are conferences now. What they're doing is they're offering on-site daycare, which is brilliant, right? And if you need, like, you're right there. And so, so smart. So it's the way we are starting to take this into consideration, which is amazing, which really is amazing. So the next piece is we want to gather facts, research, and consult. So we've identified our issue. We've challenged our own assumptions. Now let's try to, you know, solve for this issue. So we want to gather facts. So the first step in the process um, is what we want to talk about is, is this ha uh, having an impact on a particular group? Right? But when we gather our facts, we don't want to go to just the usual sources. Right? We want to make sure that we're consulting diverse sources. So years, a couple years ago, um, big organizations like Facebook and Google, they had introduced a health benefit. And the health benefit was this. They were going to offer $10,000 for young women coming into the workplace that want to freeze their eggs. Right? So they were including that in a health benefit. So this is a couple years ago. Great. But who did you consult? Right? Have you consulted the young women coming into the workplace? Have you consulted, con consulted women who are perhaps a bit older and how they feel about it? Have you consulted people who have gone through the exact process? Because guess what? It's not just about the money. It's also about the sick days. It's also about what you go through in that process. Right? I'm not against this policy program, anything like that. I think fantastic. Right? They're introducing it as a benefit. But my question becomes, who did you consult? And what other pieces are there to support this wonderful health benefit that you want to provide for those who choose to do that? Let's also think about cultural taboos around that too. Right? Yes.
there are no studies on that yet. I just knew that that's what they introduced. And then I took that and I, I started questioning, right? Like when we develop a policy, and again, I think the intentions are in the right place. I actually think when we design stuff like that, the intentions are in the right place. Let's look at execution. When I'm designing something like that, who have I consulted? Where have I gotten my facts from? And to your point, am I monitoring and evaluating? Right? Huge piece. But I do know there aren't any studies on that right? as of right now. Um, so we want to go beyond the usual sources. We can look at things when we're gathering facts. We can go to websites. We can go to uh, reports. We can go to people's social media to get kind of a fuller picture of what the issue might be. We can also find disaggregated data, um, which is the foundation of analysis. However, you might not always have access to it, right? So you can look at things like stats can, um, and we also want to research and consult. So again, the biggest piece on gathering data is we want to talk to a broad range of stakeholders. Because one stakeholder might have one perspective, another stakeholder might have a different perspective. I work a lot in higher education. We always talk about students' perspective, very different than faculty's perspective, very different than administration's perspective and then communities' perspectives, and then parents' perspectives, and so on and so forth. So if I'm trying to develop an initiative at a university or college, who's, which stakeholders have I consulted about it? In our industry, we often say, build it and they will come. We build it, they don't come. Right? Well, they don't come because we never consulted the students that might benefit from it. Let me give you one more example. When I have a class of 30 students, in my class of 30 students in higher education, I have full-time students, I have part-time students, I have commuter students, I have resident students, I have international students, I have domestic students, I have students who work, I have students who have children, I have students who uh, take care of their other um, adults at home, all these different variables. So when do I make my office hours? Right? If I make it after class, what about my students who have to run to work to pay for their tuition? Okay, fine, what if I make it before class? What about my students who have to take two buses in order to get to my class, right? So when we think about this, we want to consult diverse sources to understand what would be best. Uh, so I, I actually say this to my students, and the, what we decide on is half an hour before class, half an hour after class, and one hour during the week where they know I will be completely accessible online, right? Because the other part of it is I can't be available 24-7. And that should not be the expectation either. And, but I consult them. I consult them. I consult my admin. This is what I'm going to propose. Is this OK? We want to consult diverse sources. And not just enough to consult general public, because diverse voices need to be heard on the issues that affect them. All right, I'm going to give you five minutes to do this activity. Um, and this is a straight quote. Women account for about 20% of the all uh, uni ununiformed, sorry, all uniformed officers in Canada, more than ever before, but still a minority despite their growing numbers, especially in top ranks where they hold 12% of jobs. In your group, if you were to conduct a GBA+, I want you to think about uh, the improvement of recruitment and retention of female uniformed offices, officers in Canada. But the question that you're answering is this, who are you going to consult? So as a group, you want to recruit more uniformed um, officers that identify as female. So you have to do that initiative. Who do you consult first? Right? Who is going to be the, the sources that you consult? Three minutes, go ahead. Sorry, guys, I'm going to get your attention up here. Five more minutes, that's all we have together. Who are we consulting? So we talked about um, consulting people who had gone through the process but terminated before. Yes. Brilliant. Excellent. Who else are we consulting? Yes. Um, we were thinking of a system where we kind of start at the top and see what women at the, like, at the highest ranks, what obstacles they face getting to those positions or what deterrents there are for women to be in those positions. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of go down the ranks and see sort of how those differ. Yes. Um, yeah, by consulting with people kind of across the board. Brilliant. Excellent. Who else? Yes. Are you talking about a, a breadth of Yes. Or it could be um, current women who are in the program, their superiors. So we looked at really the whole gamut of, of individuals and teachers. Brilliant, right? And come, I saw your hand first, then you can come here. Yes. Uh, we also discussed like, the group um, where women learn about these jobs. So, like high school, like, are they aware that these are job options? Like, do they have a like, career path? Or mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Excellent. We're going to build on that. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Love it. Brilliant. And let's even take it a step further. What about children's storybooks? Right? Children's storybooks. How many storybooks have those who identify as female police officers? So I wrote a children's book in 2018, and I made sure that the elementary school teacher was a male person of color. That was another case study we were going to do, but we don't have time. Right? The loss of the male voice in elementary schools. Don't even, like, forget about the plus piece, right? So think about children's storybooks. We can go as far as that. Excellent. So we're going to consult our diverse sources. Then we develop options and make recommendations. So we want to reflect on the stakeholder perspectives. We want to identify any potential differential outcomes for certain groups. Also understanding that if I implement this recruitment retention plan, it actually might be creating other barriers for other groups, right? So we want to make sure we reflect on that and identify that and then also propose measures to mitigate unequal impacts. And when we go through this process, we want to ensure that we're monitoring, we're evaluating. These are the stakeholders I spoke to. These are the ones I couldn't speak to because they were, were unavailable. And that might be some further research that we can do. Because it's not just about who we spoke to, it's also about whose voice was missing. Perhaps they were not accessible, right? Um, we also want to document and communicate because others can learn from the research that we do. If I'm talking to certain groups and another person is creating a program initiative, we want to make sure that we communicate that. It also fosters buy-in. So document, document, document. Who did you talk to? Who didn't you talk to? What did the data and sources, or what data and sources did you review? Which ones would you have liked to review but did not? And what did the information tell you about possible issues related to your initiative, whether it's a policy, whether it's a program, whether it's an event? And then also when we communicate, it establishes due diligence, right? Like we surveyed um, X number of people and the women said they wanted daycare on site at the conferences. It also fosters buy-in and identifies areas for further action. Because here's the thing, when we implement GBA+, it's not like we've, we've arrived at the answer and that's it. It continues to change. We evaluate, we monitor. And so this GBA+, process, we can use multiple different times. And what's the benefits of using this process? We generate crucial information about the range of needs, priorities, capacities, experiences, interests, and views that are of differently situated individuals. We all experience situations differently depending on our circumstances, right? It allows us to generate that crucial information so that we are as informed as we can be. And that's the important part, as we can be. It allows us to identify barriers and negative impacts of certain policies, of certain programs and initiatives that might be in existence, and also allows us to um, really recognize and accommodate human rights and support all citizens fully in realizing their potential as members of Canadian society. And it could be as simple as using GBA Plus in our emails, or in an entire event that we're planning, or at our board, right? We can use this in multitudes of, a multitude of ways. So on that note, there's so much more that we can speak about. I was just sharing with the organizers, I, like this, I wish I had you all day. Like we would have so much fun and there would be learning, but there's so much more. This, we just scratched the surface today. We just scratched the surface. I encourage you to go on the WAGE website. You can do the course for free. Um, it's really, really, really good and allows us to challenge our own assumptions. And I want to say thank you to all of you for joining the session this morning, um, which is now afternoon. I am going to throw it over to Miriam, but I just want to take a second to share my gratitude. I can't wait to see what you do for the world. That makes me a little emotional. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.